Okay, a little bit of open phones action here. Good morning, John King. Hey, good morning, Peter. And it is a great morning. I picked my wife up from the airport at like 12.30 last night. Yes! Freedom. I'm no longer a single parent. All is right with the world. Yeah, And I apologize to my audience. We didn't have open (laughs) phones for a long time because I had to have a backup plan in case I couldn't make it to work. Right, yes. Because of the whole single parenting thing. Right. And uh, luckily... Uh, all of my dominoes hit, and I was able to come do the show every day. But we haven't had open phones for so long. Right, I know. It's and you, you, you have a backlog of stuff. Like, literally, I've got a backup computer just to hold all the sound files. Because we've had an announcement from Hillary, an announcement from Rubio, right. and all kinds of stuff happening locally. So what I'm going to do is is I'm going to start with something local here. And uh, I'm, I'll use the short version, because there's so much we have to do in a half an hour. Right. All right, so and th- this I just thought was eerie. <clears throat> Weird, weirdly eerie. Uh, an anonymous source has uh, sent to KGVO News some emails from the Prospect Meadows Homeowners Association. Wondering, well, where is that? Well, that just happens to be the neighborhood where German exchange student Darren Dayday was shot while trespassing in the garage of Marcus Karma almost exactly one year ago. Can you believe that? That happened on April 27th, almost a year ago, 2014. All right. Now, one of the emails detailed the break-in and theft from a pickup truck. Another apparently involved teenagers ringing a homeowner's doorbell and then fleeing, quoting one of the emails, and I quote, I am amazed at anyone trying to do anything in this neighborhood considering the events that happened last year, end quote. The Homeowners Association is advising its members to lock their vehicles, keep their garage garages closed and locked, they day was shot April 27th while garage hopping, and Marcus Karma is now serving a 70-year sentence in the Montana State Prison. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna confess. When I was a kid, uh, there was a curfew in Lolo, where we hung out a lot. Right, and I did this all the time. Not the robbing of a vehicle sort of thing, but the ring someone's doorbell, run, yeah. run away. Yeah, maybe well, there was a bag of poop with the. <laughs> A piece must, of paper that was lit on I fire. Must, I must say that I have experienced the whole burning bag of poop on my <laughs> front porch, okay? Well, I didn't. I don't come to visit that often because of the insults. <laughs> <laughs> that did happen to me. However, I did know exactly what it was when I looked on my front porch and realized there is a sack and it's on fire. <laughs> they want me to stamp on it. I think I will decline. So I think part of this is just that, but... I think a big part of this, if I will be surprised, I'll eat my shorts if it's not boys. Because this looks like the kind of push your luck stupidity that boys do. You know, can you jump off that bridge higher than I did? Can you, you know, kind of get, get well, into the danger zone? You have to remember, and, and this, is, this is a physiological fact, that the decision-making process in the teenage brain is not fully developed. It's just not. And so that's why teenagers... Uh, that that's that's the area of the brain that says is this a good idea or not well sure you know so <laughs> and so they do dumb things they just do dumb things right. and so we should make the voting age 14 <laughs> clearly <laughs> clearly uh, anyway so 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 I, I just thought i'd throw that out there because it just seemed eerily ironic to me mm-hmm. that that neighborhood would be experiencing some... Now, I, I spoke with the, our friend uh, Travis Welsh at the police department, and he has assured me that there are car break-ins and everything's going on all over Missoula. It isn't just in that neighborhood, but uh, the, the Neighborhood Association up there just happened to warn its members that that was what was going on. So, yeah. All right. Uh, Mike is on Talk Back. Hi, Mike. Well, yeah, if you, any of you read Saturday, if you looked at Saturday's paper, right on the front page, there's a mountain lion foot talk caught in a trap. I'm sure everybody's seen that. Uh, a close examination by a trapper, you cannot ring off a foot in a center swivel trap. Believe me, that is impossible. That's why they're called swivels. So it's a plant? Yeah. Okay. Very pure and simple. That was. <laughs> this is another one of them setups at all. Oh, yeah, look what we found. Right. Well, <laughs> it is a trap, I can tell you that's just not going to happen. So. Well, hey, thanks for the update, Mike. 
All righty. Appreciate That's it, buddy. what open phones Thank you. is for. There you go. Okay, yeah. so now now what, what have you, Mr. King? Okay. Um, tons of stuff here. Yeah, we do have tons of stuff. I'm trying to think of what we should start with. Well, uh, how, how, about the, how about the one with Hillary, the Saturday Night Live skit? That's a good four minutes. Yeah, I, I've, got, I've got four minutes before we have our next break. Let's go ahead and play it. This right. actually came out on Saturday, yeah, hence Saturday, Saturday Night Live, yeah. uh, before Hillary's announcement. They're nothing similar. Right. <laughs> But <laughs> this but was it, much more entertaining, actually. <laughs> pretty hilarious. <laughs> All right, you ready? <laughs> here we here we go. Now try to. A lot of these are sight gags. Okay, so no, I cut them okay, out. Okay, tomorrow's the big day, Mrs. Clinton. going to announce that you're running for president. Oh my gosh, I don't know if I have it in me. I'm scared. I'm kidding. Let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Hillary, you put the hill in hilarious. <laughs> now, since we're announcing your candidacy via social media, we thought it would be fun if you actually filmed the video yourself on your own phone. That way it seems more personal and intimate. Uh, 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 now, want to do some vocal warm-ups and then we'll get started? Ooh, okay, I'd love to. Uh, uh. <clears throat> Hillary's a granny with a twinkle in her eye. <laughs> Hillary's a granny and she makes an apple pie. First female president, first female president, me, 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 me. <laughs> hey, great, Mrs. Clinton. Okay, now hold up your phone mm -hmm, and you can mm -hmm. just look natural, okay? okay? okay. Action. Citizens, you will elect me. I will be your leader. Okay, okay great. Let, let's stop there. No. Um, okay. Okay. Ma'am, I, I think you may be coming off as just a little hard. Oh shoot. What part? What part? Um, well, <laughs> sort of all of it. Uh -huh. um, but but that's okay. Let's okay. try again. And remember, you said this new campaign is not about you. Okay. You know, it's about the people. So let's try one where you don't say I or even your own name. Okay. Oh, that'll be easy. Got it. Hello, tis I, Hillary Clinton. <laughs> Let's stop again, okay? Um, you said I and your full name immediately. Yes, oh no. shoot, I did? Uh, yeah, yeah, but don't worry, okay. we'll just delete that one off your phone. Okay. Well, <laughs> know a thing or two about that, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Christina, meet my hand in the okay. air. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes. Good, good. Okay, uh, let, let's uh, keep going, and um, this time maybe focus on all that you've done for women's rights. Oh, okay, that's good. I am running because I want to be a voice for women everywhere. Did someone say women everywhere? <laughs> Hillary would make a great president, and I would make an even greater first dude. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. That's nice. Hillary, isn't it crazy that phones can take videos now? Yeah. I mean, if they could have done that in the 90s, <laughs> I'd be in jail. <laughs> Great, Bill. I love jokes about that. <laughs> Okay, I get it. <clears throat> this election is about you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't want to hog your limelight. No. I am leaving. Yep. Look at me go. Yep. Bye. I'm gone. <laughs> Aren't we such a fun, approachable dynasty? <laughs> All right. Um, you know what? Let, let's refocus on your uh -huh. candidacy. Okay. And remember, the new Hillary is humble and gracious. Yes, got it. I know this election season won't be easy. I'm sure I will face some stiff competition from my fellow Democrats. People like Martin O'Malley, who could really give me a run for my money. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a Simpsons character. <laughs> ah, okay, let me keep going. At the end of the day, America, you deserve a leader who cares about you, and that is why I would make a great president. And surprise, I will be her VP. And if anything happens to her, God forbid, I will happily be president of the United States again. It would be Bill Clinton too, bigger. And black. Oh, Bill. <laughs> oh, Bill. Bill, Bill, Bill. All right, okay. okay. <laughs> uh, uh, he's joking, America. My vice president, of course, will be me. Okay. <laughs> okay, man, man, once again.
again, you, you can't be your own vice president. We will see about that. <laughs> okay, there All we right. are. We're, we're way past the break. We are way past the break. But you know what? It's a perfect time for it. <sighs> oh, yeah. The perfect coffee. time to take a morning coffee break. Sure. So we're, we're going to give uh, away a free coffee and toast for the Rocket Coffee. Rocket Coffee Company, up and, up and away! <laughs> That's great. Yeah, thank, That's you. great. thank you. And uh, we'll be giving that uh, away right now. Give us a call during the break. You can get your Rocket Coffee. Uh, you can get your uh, coffee at the shopping center, Eastgate Shopping Center at 1000 East Broadway. Right across from there. All right. Uh, give us a call, 721-1290. The first caller, ladies and gentlemen, wins a fabulous cup of coffee and a delicious slice of toast with your choice of topping. I like it. We'll be right back. <laughs> I feel like I'm stuck in an airplane movie. All right, 721-1290. Peter <laughs> keeps rocketing away. <laughs> I'm loving this giveaway thing. It's yeah. fun to talk to people that don't hate me. <laughs> Well, you know, you, you talk on the radio, usually the people call in because they're angry or they have some point to make. Right, right. Now, right. Let's get to it. I want to get to my point. But, you know, when you give away something for free, they're grateful and they talk a little bit about how happy they are to listen to the show every morning. And it's right, right. kind of nice to talk to people there on that know. different level. Happy people. Yeah. People who get to win free coffee and stuff. So, okay, uh, so one that- of the things that I wanted to talk about was the point counterpoint uh, between... <laughs> Hillary Clinton and Marco Rubio. Right. Now, uh, I, I, I use the word counterpoint because it's a really interesting dilemma that happened here. One of the best moments of the Marco Rubio address, which everybody already probably knows that listens to the show, I think he's the most likely candidate for right. the Republicans. Um, his story uh, was very personal. He talked about how his dad had to run a bar and how he worked his way from the back of the counter. Right. Uh, up through, you know, he went, he was a county commissioner and then he was a uh, speaker of the house in right, Florida right, and right. now he's a senator. And so, he, you know, just talking about uh, the ability to he, progress and achieve in up. America. Right. right. Yeah. And uh, the American dream and having a new century, an American century. Uh, right, again. right. Well, that counter story uh, is a little bit different than the one that happened for Hillary on the same day. And she basically uh, got a whole bunch of news buzz by a approaching a counter for what might be the first time to buy a burrito. It was hilarious watching the media cover this story. Now, I have a clip in here. This is Mark Halperin. Okay. Uh, a, you know, Got it. author, commentary. Right. Yeah, serious guy. <laughs> <laughs> he, he is so laughable here. All right. The enthusiasm that the left has for Hillary Clinton is so blatant. Just play this clip and, and listen to how he oogs and oogles and ahs over someone buying a burrito. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, Hillary Clinton and the burrito. Her problem now is not to prove people that she's ready to be president because people think she is. The two words she needs are fun and new. And part of why yesterday was so <laughs> successful is she looks like she's having fun and she's doing for her new stuff. We've never seen her get a burrito before. That's exactly what it is. Fun and new. It's, it's all total. Yeah, at this point. she's just she's got to drive. Nobody, fun nobody's and new. questioning her credentials. Yeah, but, yeah, you know. But on foreign policy, on domestic policy, she doesn't have to prove a thing. I have a shiver going up my, my leg. For you. Fun and new. <laughs> foreign policy, domestic policy. She doesn't have to prove a thing. Forget that. Forget that. This stuff. lady can buy a burrito. Yeah, she bought her own. But that here's the question: Did she pay for her own burrito? That's a good question. And not only that, I understand that there was a tip jar there. I want to know if she put money in the tip jar. Now, this is a weird flashback, but Chipotle is a very frequented place for Democratic candidates. Do you remember when Barack Obama got in a little bit of trouble for going to a Chipotle and leaning over the uh, the spit shield that they have there right. so you don't get your... right. <laughs> To talk to somebody. Oh, no. So I, I don't know. I don't know if she's trying to run the Obama campaign again because Obama, 2008, introduces, introduces right. himself with a right. video. Right. Goes on a tour. Yeah. Of course, he got out and actually talked to people. But <laughs> in this case, she walks into the Chipotle with her sunglasses on. Yes. I don't know. I, I think it's weird that people wear sunglasses, but I have kind of squinty eyes. But when you're inside a building, isn't yeah. it a little... Kind of harder to see with sunglasses? They, they must have been Foster Grants. I don't know. But so. they look like the same pair that she's wearing in that infamous cell phone texting picture. Yeah. You know, the one where yeah. she looks like she's erasing emails. <laughs> let's go. All to right, let's, let's get to the phones. Eric, good morning. Uh, save us from our silliness here. What's going on? Yes, this is the blind person calling. Uh, yes, what's going uh, on, Eric? Yes. Yes, I believe the, that the American government and its yes. puppeteers is our enemy over and above Iran. <laughs> 
Uh, however, uh, I, would, I would like, uh, I will, what I say will evince whether I'm blind or not, and I would like to remind people of several things in the midst of the distraction of Iran. Operation Gladio, number one. Operation Northwoods, number two. Which doctrine was the precursor to events like 9-11, Sandy Hook, and the Boston Marathon bombing? CIA drug running and their overthrow of legitimate governments. The arming of every American bureau. NSA capture and storing of every electronic communication. Well, I think it's pretty clear you've proven yourself to be blind. You think 9-11 was caused by the U.S. government. Story preemptive, preemptive war. The U.S. military training on U.S. soil in preparation of war. Oh my goodness! American Our troops people. training before they go to war. I'm shocked. Training for war against oh. the American people. Now that's that's a little the, bit of an addendum there. The, the militarization of the American police forces for war against the American mm-hmm. people. The U.S. government documents specifying that normal Americans are domestic extremists for beliefs like uh, supporting Ron Paul, anti-abortion proponents, Second Amendment proponents, and First Amendment proponents. And I'd like to remind the American people that no war we fought since becoming a country with the exception of the War of 1812 has resulted in the recovery of our freedoms or even the maintenance of our freedoms. Right. Uh, Getting getting rid of Imperial Japan didn't save anybody in Hawaii. Each war has progressively stripped the American people of their freedoms. And your problem, along with most Americans, is they won't take an honest look at this. I have taken a look at it. Yeah, no, you haven't. The definition (laughs) of insanity... The Sorry, definition go ahead. Hey, of go insanity. Ahead. You're, you're just so sure of yourself. I, I have there. listened to you yeah. do this pitch like 17 times. I know. You're not only blind on these issues, you are redundant. Yeah, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting <laughs> different results. Exactly, Eric. Thank you. Yes. And, th- and thank you for the call, and thank you for the example. By the way, we're, we're up against that, 721-1290. Uh, Catherine is uh, waiting. Catherine, we'll get you on here in just a second. We have two lines open, 721-1290. I'm sorry, Eric, you stepped into that one. We'll be right back. And we're back on TalkBack. 721-1290 is our number. Let's get right to the phones. We have about two and a half minutes before our hard break. So, Catherine, good morning. Good morning. Just a quick one. Sure. Uh, apparently, uh, what was it, yesterday or the day before, she was at a coffee shop, and she announced to the Iowans collected there uh, that she was going to drink her way across Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah! So, uh, you know, obviously she meant coffee, but the way she said it and the misstatement is kind of funny. Now, anyway. can, 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 can you imagine... Hillary Clinton, a woman who probably hasn't driven her own car in, what, the last 20 years, mm-hmm. is driving in a minivan. Riding. I'm sorry, riding, riding in a minivan named Scooby. Yeah. I wish they had the, the, the I thought it was going to be like flower power on the sides and right, stuff. Right. You know, kind of like the mystery van from right. the actual Scooby. <laughs> but it's it's all black and stealthy and very intimidating. The magical mystery tour. Yeah. <laughs> I just anyway. wish I just wish I could be there. Oh okay. yeah. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Catherine. Sure. Uh, Christine, we got about a minute and a half. Go ahead. I was just going to ask John if he had looked at Marco Rubio's uh, tax plan. I have not yet seen his tax plan. I'll be honest. Because I looked at it, and I will not be voting for him. Now, this is the tax plan that he went with. Uh, it's actually this is older, right? You're talking what's, about the one he voted for that he recommended along with another. No, no, no. This re- is his new proposal. Real, real quickly, what's re- in a minute? What's wrong with it? Uh, it raises taxes on families making more than seventy-five thousand a year by getting rid of the child tax credit. Um, no, by raising the rate, the percent to thirty-five percent. Hmm. Well, I haven't checked it out. I will definitely do that. Okay. All right. Is there anything else that is... Well, oh, never mind. That, that's it. Bye. See ya. <laughs> okay. So, we have a little less than a minute. We have a special guest in studio. We're going to be talking about uh, adoption and, yes. f- and foster homes. A very serious issue. Which and John it, is seriously considering for his own house. Ah, very so cool. Very maybe cool. I'll yeah. do that on air. I'll I'm, find out why I'm not a possible candidate for parenting <laughs> live.
in just a few minutes. <laughs> I think she's, she's smiling. <laughs> Katie's going, I hate to give you the bad news, John, but you're just too weird. You can't have a samurai sword on your hilt <laughs> while parenting. It's, it's, that's illegal. We're, we're, we're going to come right back. Stay with us. Uh, Talk Back continues here in a moment. And a special guest in the studio with us from 9 till 10. And we'll have, we're going to have a voice with us that you may have heard earlier this morning on our on our newscast. Uh, welcome back to Talk Back. We're going to be visiting with with uh, Katie Gurdon, who's with us from Youth Dynamics. How you doing, Katie? Good. Thank it's good, you. It's good to see you. Thank you for having me. You bet. It's our pleasure. Now, first of all, if you wouldn't mind telling us what Youth Dynamics is all about. Um, Youth Dynamics is a nonprofit um, children's mental health center and child placing agency. So we um, license foster parents as well as offer an array of community-based services to help support children and keep them in, t- in the community. We've got locations all over the state of Montana. Wow. Now, now um, one of the things, or the thing I really wanted to talk about today was the issue of foster care and the state of it in, in Montana, mm-hmm. which you're personally involved in in the Missoula area. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll just kind of give everybody a quick heads up. Uh, I do plan on hopefully adopting maybe in the next three or four years wow. after my wife uh, finishes becoming a nurse practitioner. So I'm kind of feeling out for the future. Right now, it's not going to happen. <laughs> now, <laughs> so now, you have three kids right have, now, right? I have three kids of my own. And, and they're how old? Uh, seven, uh, four, and one. Okay. So it's a pretty big spread. Sure. And uh, two of those I uh, cannot leave alone or... Of course. Even for like 12... I, if I go to the bathroom, I come back and the house is destroyed. So uh, it'd, be a little, it'd be a little untimely for me to uh, put a little bit more on my plate right now. But um, I, I was really shocked to find um, from talking with uh, some people at um, Health and Human Services last week for this uh, pinwheel thing that they were doing in Helena that the foster uh, child rate, the number of kids in foster care system is at an all-time high. I was hoping you could kind of give us some perspective on that. Tell us what the state is like now. Just kind of go through some of the numbers if you could. But Okay. Well, um, I brought some numbers with me. Um, in 2009, it was hovering around um, on, in a snapshot of one day, 1,500 youth in the foster care system. Now, that's just one day. Um, the average is about 3,000 um, children a year in the state of Montana will enter the foster care system. Not all of them will stay in the foster care system throughout the year, but the average length of stay is about 26.5 months for a youth to be in the foster care system. Um, what's kind of unfortunate about that is we have about half as many homes as the youth that are in the foster care system. Now, why do kids go into the foster care system? I think that that'd be good for people to understand, mm-hmm. like... Is it, I mean, if I, you know, we think of like orphans from like comic book movies and Annie and all these other things, like the parents are just gone. Oliver mm-hmm. Twist. Oh, yeah, <laughs> right. But and a lot of times these parents are still around, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The um, vast majority of children will enter the foster care system due to abuse and neglect. It's really a small percentage of youth that enter due to other circumstances than that. Um, it's quite unfortunate for me because um, a lot of the. N- children who will enter the foster care system through um, due to child abuse and neglect. Poverty is a huge issue with that, um, um, especially in neglect, neglect cases. Mm-hmm. Um, so and it's a big issue here. So, so you're dealing with kids that aren't just missing their parents. They're possibly traumatized from abuse. Um, yeah. The vast majority of them are. It's very traumatizing. It's very traumatizing for a youth to be removed from their home in general, regardless um, of whether there was abuse and trauma involved. Um, children love their parents um, regardless of what they've been through. So it's extremely traumatizing for youth to be removed. Now, if, if I can ask you, uh, I, I, I don't know if you are part of the child and family services that actually go into the home to determine if there's been neglect and abuse. So that, that's not you, right? No. Um, okay. If we're working um, with the youth and we suspect that, just like anybody else who's a mandated reporter, we call, but we don't. Our job is not to investigate that. Sure, sure, sure. But, but your job is to prevent it from happening in yes. future homes, right? Yes. Um, we Well, our job is to prevent it from happening in future homes. Um, we work with our foster parents to wrap around them and support the youth and the foster parent to prevent that. We also work with children before um, on the mental health services side with families to help give them the skills and link them to the resources and services to prevent the removal from happening altogether. I want to I want to give you the the pull of my heart, the tug of war that I have personally, and I'm sure it's something you deal with with other parents. Um, 
but I, I'm caught knowing the kind of background these kids might have. Right. And, I, and, you know, I'm sure if I actually meet some of these kids, it would totally change my perspective. Mm-hmm. But, you know, not knowing them, just knowing that they've had some issues, most likely uh, there's been some trauma. There's going to be difficulties. Mm-hmm. Um, my problem isn't that I'm going to have an issue or difficulty dealing with the child. My problem is how is this going to affect my children? So I'm pulled with my own my father's heart and my my heart for others at the same time. And I want to know, like, how you coach people through that decision-making process. And if you, you are a family that has kids in the home, um, is there any kind of vetting that goes on? Yeah, do you, do you vet the kids? I mean, or, or is that something, in other words, the kids that are in the home, do you, do you also visit with them to find, how do you feel about this? I oh, mean, absolutely. Yeah. That is a very important part. Like, for instance, if you have one parent that's ready to go and wants to do this, but the rest of the family is resistant or isn't, sh- like, unsure, then it's not going to work because the whole family has to be on board or else it's going to create stress in the home when a youth is placed and then the placement will break down and that ultimately that child will have to be moved to another placement, which is even more traumatizing for the youth. So we was, want... Yeah, I was going to ask you, what yeah. is the most difficult thing, getting a child into a home, if they got their own bedroom or they're, you know, they, they've got their routine started and then something happens and then, well, they have to move to another... That, that's good for, for a youngster. Is that the worst thing? This the worst thing I mean if anybody can just remember from back when you when you were a child like the thought I mean at least for me like as a kid like the thought of even my parents like getting divorced or moving schools that was horrific for me so I can't even imagine what these foster children go through because it's not uncommon for them to not only be removed from their parents which is very frightening that's all I know but then to go to a foster home and then be removed from that as well, and then to another foster home. And each time, they're usually changing schools, changing friends, changing support systems. And getting farther away from their original family, right? Yeah. 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 And, and their identity. And their identity. So. Oftentimes away from siblings and everything else. They right. lose everyone. So we're up against a break. Seven two one twelve ninety. If you have a question for Katie, lines are open. Uh, she's here to take your calls, answer your questions. If you have maybe you're like John and considering uh, maybe adopting someday. Maybe just a good place to get your questions answered right here. Katie's going to be with us till 10. 721-1290 is our number, and we'd love to hear from you right after this. Hey, we're back on TalkBack. 721-1290 is our number. We we have all three lines open. If you'd like to visit with Katie Gurdon from Youth Dynamics, we're talking about adoption. I was just kind of sharing my story. Uh, those who have been listening to the show for a long time know that I came from a broken home. Uh, I, my mom and dad were divorced when I was nine. We lived in a beautiful home in Bryn Mawr Park, Virginia, right outside Washington, D.C., and one day, my mom and dad called my brother and I into the living room and said, hey, guess what? We're getting divorced. And, hello? <laughs> so, into the station wagon we went, drove 2,500 miles across the country, living in my grandparents' basement, you know. And so, so a, a, as a nine-year-old kid, uh, I was like, I, I look back on that time of my life and said, man, how did I even get through that? And, and, but, but that isn't anywhere near as bad as what some of these kids have had to go through, right? Yeah, these kids go through a lot. Um, Like I was saying before, that not only that trauma of being removed, but then to go into a home with people they don't know. um, And kind of, you know, for a youth, um, when they come from such a hard background um, with abuse and neglect in the home, um, as I was saying before, they don't know any different. Um, So for them, that's normal. so when they're removed, it's very traumatizing. And a lot of them, though, manifest a lot of is- issues which come from that background and that, you know, where they came from. And they, and they don't, and they tend, those issues, a lot of times it's hard for parents to work with. Um, and I think that's why, you know, at Youth Dynamics, we really try to wrap around foster parents and the youth and kind of, you know, give them a lot of um, education and whatnot on what to expect from the youth that's in their home and then wrap around them working with the youth um, and the parent to help them work behaviorally with that child. And you, you have two things to work on. Uh-huh. For, for, first of all, you have to find the families, okay? Mm-hmm. And then I understand there's quite the process of vetting and investigating and backgrounds. And, and mm-hmm. sometimes you have to get a little personal asking about things oh, because, yeah. because you're looking at a home where these vulnerable little kids are going to be staying. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, you have to deal with the kids and find out what their situation is. Mm-hmm. And then trying to match all that together, it's got to be very difficult. Um, it's, a, it's a process. Um, it's, it's more work, I'd say, on my part than the parents' part that yeah, I license. Yeah. Um, 
I like to think that there's no there's no family or there's no parent that well there's certainly circumstances but everybody has a strength that they can offer a youth and there's always a good match for a youth um and you know I have a lot of I have had some parents that are just I love them super quirky and um but like I why had, is she staring at me like, I, I, don't I don't know, know. <laughs> I'm sorry you got quirky <laughs> I don't know. and you've been doing the rocketeer yeah. move all morning so super fits as well um I try to think that the people who have absolutely you know when I do a, a st- like a home study and I go into license a parent and I have a family that's just presents completely perfect like never had you know there's no there's nothing that's ever really happened to them white picket fence would you like a piece uh, of apple pie <laughs> <laughs> they, um well I'm sure there's a youth there's you know there's youth for them as well I think for them sometimes it's harder than the people who you know have come from you know, harder backgrounds or, you know, lived, had a lot of life experience because they are able to relate to these youth in a way. They'll that, be, they'd be more empathic. Yeah, they can sympathize. They can, they can sympathize and they, they're just, they're able to form a unique bond with the youth. And those have been my most, my best success stories, actually. So t- tell me what it's like. What sort of things do you look for when you're looking at a home of, of those that, because frankly, one of the things that I, I, I thought about when I decided to have this show is like, you know, maybe I can't, have a foster kid right now, but I have 26,000 listeners in Missoula and I bet there's a good portion of people out there that probably could. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to hear from you. What are some of the things you look for as a good home, uh, some, uh, a home that's qualified to house a foster kid? Um, some things that I look for are, um, well, a, I mean, this is kind of obvious, but you can't be a a sexual Mm -hmm. offender, um, or a violent offender. Um, I don't really look at whether people are single or couples. I don't look at that. Really? Uh, no. Um, I, you know, I look at the home um, to make sure that there's adequate space for a youth. Um, you know, uh, the youth can't sleep in the living room. They need to have a bedroom. Um, the youth can share a bedroom with another youth that's relatively to the close to the same age um, and same gender. Um, I don't really look at resources, just that they have enough to meet their own meet their own needs. Um, so if, if I was a single dad and I was working this job every day, I would think, man, you're not you're not quite making the cut. You're not going to be able to do a very good job. No. But that's just me judging myself. Yeah, that's not true, though. You um, think so? so you find that that's a, a stable home for foster that's kids? That's a stable home for a foster kid. Um, I may not place a preschool age child in that home just because um, – and. You, if a child's under five, there need there should be somebody that's available okay. at all times for the youth. But after five, they go to school, and then so and then youth dynamics. Um, we help to find um, help parents find childcare, um, like if a parent works till five, or we can match the youth with a mentor after school for a couple hours, um, or after school programs, summer programs. Um, but that's not a barrier for somebody okay. being a foster so parent. There's lots of other help out there. Yeah, there's lots of help. Okay, now let, me, let me ask you this. Uh, when, when, when uh, I, I hate to sound mercenary here, but, but when, uh, let's, say, let's say John and Ruth uh, adopt a child, and the child comes down with an illness, uh, are, is it just like their kid? Is there, are they, they put them on their insurance, do they, or, or is, is that covered through your organization, or how, how does that work? I, and again, I mean, it sound selfish or anything, but, you know, what if we weren't expecting this, this, this whatever this is, a broken leg or whatever? I mean... Um, the children are completely covered under Medicaid even um, after they're done with foster care. Um, they get covered with all that. So there's no cost to the parent in medical-wise. They have insurance. Okay. And, and So we have this blossoming foster care problem, right? One of the issues in it is that it's really hard to place kids over a certain age, right? Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, you, she, <laughs> like, she's like shrugging. You can yeah, see her yeah, face. It's, yeah. it's really hard. Uh-huh. Tell, tell us about the stories there when we get back from this next break. We'll, we'll take a break. And uh, again, we still have all three lines open. I'd love to get some calls uh, for Katie uh, because it's a nice lady doing a good thing for kids. And if you have a question or a comment, we'd love to hear from you. 721-1290. Hey, we're back on Talkback. 721-1290 is our number. 1-800-568-5309. Uh, joining us in studio, we have uh, we have uh, Katie Gurdon who's with us from Youth Dynamics, and she's helping to place kids in foster homes. Real quick question from one of our listeners who couldn't stay with us. Tracy wants to know, is there an age minimum and maximum or maximum for the, the foster home parents? The, um, 18 is the age minimum. 
Um, we usually don't license parents under 21. Okay. Um, yeah, but there's no age maximum. And and we'll we'll, we'll get into this after after candy. <laughs> but there's a lot of the a, a lot of the process is up to your judgment call, which is I think going to be an interesting discussion. But let's go to Katie first. Yeah. Uh, All right, uh, Candy. Sorry. Candy. Good morning. You're on Talk Back with Katie. Hi. Good morning. Good morning, Katie. How are you this morning? Good. How are you? I'm good too. Um, I testified on behalf of parents that were unjustly accused of abuse and neglect from 2002 until 2007. I testified at all the child protection, uh, health and human services, uh, dealing with foster care and adoption and um, in Helena. And I also testified for the public defender system to have uh, parents uh, that were accused of abuse and neglect uh, given um, uh, counsel, lawyers, immediately. Um, and this was supposed to happen in all 56 counties. Did and you know the people that you were testifying for? I mean, was this like a personal situation for you? or? Um, it became an extremely personal situation for me. Um, I dealt with it for 12 years. I still... Um, advocate for parents. Uh, I don't do it openly now, but those circumstances are something for a different time at a different show. Okay, now do you, do you have a question for Katie? Yes. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, um, a lot of these parents that are uh, accused of abuse and neglect uh, are in the poverty category. Mm -hmm. And to the best of my knowledge, uh, they are not supposed to be removed from their home because of income, mm -hmm. and to the best of my knowledge, that the foster care stay, if it falls between 15 and 22 months of uh, the case, if the children are in foster care, that their rights, the parent, parental rights are terminated because they have been in foster care for 15 of 22 months. So uh, many of these uh, parents that are looking to adopt are adopting children whose parents have been terminated, not brought into a trial or a court of justice, uh, but into family courts um, just because they were in foster care for 15 months, not because the parents did anything. Mm -hmm. So um, how do you justify or handle these adoptions and things, and I'm very well versed in this, so okay. uh, extremely well versed in this. How do you justify those adoptions when the, ch the parents have not been criminally charged with anything and that they are adopted out, their uh, well, Candy, rights are just, terminated just real quick, Candy. because of the only being <laughs> Candy, in just, just pause for, a second. for 15 months and not because yeah, the we, parents were we got it. criminally C charged. Candy, Candy, we got it. Uh, oh. So, um, Katie doesn't work for the government. So the no. judicial process, the, the process that goes into the kids going into the foster care system, you don't play a role in, right? No, we don't play a role with that. And usually but, when adoption steps in... Katie, 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 hold, uh, well, Candy, hold on. She's trying to answer your question. If you just keep talking. Go ahead, Kim. Usually when the, um, when, adop when the children are ready for adoption, the state will step in and cover that adoption while the kids are in our foster care. I think it is unfortunate that poverty does play a huge role in uh, neglect cases. But, and but what, about, what about the situation of, of 15 to 25 months? Um, 22 months. That yeah. would be more of the state role. That is true um, because the idea is to find permanency for the youth instead of sending it go for them going back and forth and back and forth. But it is really important, and of course this is up to the, the, ch cent the CFS worker, Child and Family Services worker, they make the ultimate call. But we really try as much as possible to keep the parents involved um, keep communication going and stuff like that and even, having the foster parent even play a through role the adoption that. process because from my understanding the adoption process involves the termination of parental rights therefore the parents have no rights afterwards the, the children have rights to inherit anything that the parents have but uh, you know whether or not they're adopted out but the situation being is a, how how can how do you explain to these adoptive parents 
that the uh, children were taken, not because the parents were um, uh, adjudic- adjudicated in a criminal court of law of, uh, of anything, and you're just saying to them, well, they've been in foster care for 15 out of uh, 22 months, therefore they're up for adoption, their parental rights have been terminated, okay. and they're moved out of okay. the state. Candy, you've made your point. Thanks for okay. your call. Go ahead. I always let um, my foster parents know that... Um, that they that while they're not the actual parent of the youth, I mean, it's important for them to keep a positive outlook of a youth's biological parents. Um, to especially you know with the child, they still love their parents regardless of what has happened. I have never ever once witnessed a case where the youth didn't want to go back home, didn't love their parents, and that they need to keep a positive outlook. And if it's possible that you, it's important for the parents and the biological family to stay very involved with that youth. Well, let's go to the next call. Well, and t- then, t- we're, we're up against a break. Okay. So, uh, Ryan, if you don't mind hanging on, we'll take a quick break. Come right back. We have two lines open, 721-1290. Katie Gurton with us from Youth Dynamics. Go ahead, Jeff. I'd like to make a special request. If yeah. you are a foster parent out there, yeah, I'd like to hear your story because I've heard stories from others uh, some of them make me question my decision to want to go be a foster parent. <laughs> some of them um, push me in that direction. I-, I need to hear more. I'm gathering evidence here. We'll be right back. Hey, we're back on Talkback. 721-1290 is the number. We love having you along this morning. I'm Peter Christian, John King, searching through his phone, trying to find a picture of his son <laughs> making a three-point shot. Right? Uh, multiple baskets in a row. Wow. Oh, he's really? Wow, yeah, he's, this... a f- he's a phenom. And he's only one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. Anyway, we got Travis, a call to go Travis to. Travis DeCure is already <laughs> on the line. Sign that boy up. All right, let's get let's get uh, Ryan on the phone. Ryan, good morning. You're on Talk Back with Katie. Hi. Good morning. What's up? Hey, you, you know, I just wanted to thank you guys for, for bringing the subject up today. It's awesome. I, uh, I'm actually experienced. We have, my wife and I have four kids. We did foster for the first two and, and adopted them, and then we did two international adoptions. Oh, well, wow. Good for you. That's what awesome. was the process like? Um, and which, oh, if you were to recommend one of those two tracks for a new foster parent, but not necessarily a new parent, what would you recommend? Oh, you know, we did the international is easier because you get, you know, it's, it's uh, usually kids out of orphanages or whatever, or in early placements. But foster care is awesome. It's rewarding, um, but it can be very stressful. Uh, sometimes you get children that you fall in love with and they obviously get reunified with the parents, which is the best case scenario, you know, if things work out. And so it's hard to let go. Um, but the two that we did foster and then adopt, you know, they, they had many times reunified, tried to reunify with parents. And, I mean, they, they tried to do everything they can for those kids um, and, and the parents. To get when you say they, better. you mean the, the authorities? Or the... What, what's that? Are you talking about the authorities or trying to do everything yeah, they can? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, like family service stuff. They do everything they can to try to reunify, you know. They, they, work, they work their butts off. And I really appreciate all those guys. And so there's a lot of misconceptions out there that people are taking kids away for... You know, just po- like this, said, some people talking about poverty. And stuff. You know, Ryan, really, Ryan, you bring they, up a really good point. I want to ask Katie. I, I'm going to keep you on here. Uh, uh, the difference between foster care and adoption. Um, usually, um, at least with in like not international, but um, oftentimes a youth, you, you first foster them and then the, you move into adoption with them. Um, if a child's parental rights, um, the parents' rights are terminated and that youth is available for adoption, but you need to foster for at least six months before you're able to adopt the child. Okay. So when you look at the Montana foster kid population, mm-hmm. do we know what like what percentage have parental rights terminated already? Um, I do you not know, know that exact But But number. there is a certain number of them that are... Mm-hmm adoptable and others that are going to go through situations and i thank you uh so much caller i'm sorry i don't have your name in front of right it's ryan ryan for for bringing this up because this is the heartache that i heard from another parent Mm -hmm. um they had a foster kid and actually a a child with uh, some severe disabilities that they were Mm -hmm. taking care of and uh it wasn't their first uh their first time um they they opened their door to one child um, that had some disabilities and so they got the approval Mm -hmm. um and uh, you know, they had such big hearts that they kept getting more. But they said that the hardest thing for them was, you know, they might have this kid for two or three months and then the kid would be gone or, you know, and just it was like making friends and then losing them all the time. Mm-hmm. And that was the hard part for, yeah. for you know, them. And, and, and I appreciated what, what, what the candy uh, was very concerned that that parents were losing their parental rights and it had nothing to do with you or, or what you're trying to do but it's still got to be difficult because the child doesn't really understand all that do they 
No, the child does not understand that. Yeah. They they don't really have the best understanding of Sure. All, all they know is I, I what do you mean I can't go see mom and dad? Yeah. Why 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 yeah, why, well because And they want to. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> of course they want to. Mm-hmm. And and yet the, the courts have decided that your parents have lost their parental rights. Mm-hmm. So at, at that point, let me ask you this. At that point, as a foster agency, do you try to help uh, maintain that that child parent relationship some way. Absolutely, okay. yes. Right. Um, we try in any way we can. So you don't just try to cut them off or anything. No. Oh no, yeah, okay. no, that's not good for the child. Right. That's that's not good at all for the child. Okay. There is some circumstances where um, I've only seen one one circumstance where um, one parent's rights were completely terminated, and at that point there wasn't contact. Um, but that's very rare. Okay, that sounds like the hard part for me. Like. Mm-hmm. I don't care if you're, if you're, you know, you're, even if you're 14, you come from a back, I have some sympathy for you. Mm -hmm. But if you're an occasionally abusive parent, you and I are going to have a hard time being in the same room together. (laughs) I just am not going to get along with you. I'm going to have a hard time sympathizing with you. How do you coach that part of the relationship? Because I think the hard part is, and what I always try to tell um, my foster parents is to really think and remember that a lot of these parents were the were had similar backgrounds to the youth that they're bringing into their home. They've had the par- the parents as youth had a lot of issues. They grew up in these um, circumstances that molded and shaped them into where they are today. So. Um, that's so, great, but yeah. there's also people that are just jerks, right? I yeah. Mean, just people that are, <laughs> and so, they, so, are, they are out there. So is there, is, there, is there like, I don't know, that's where I would need the coaching. That's where I would need someone to come and be like, John, you, you, you can't throw stuff at that guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. and, and I was going to ask you, uh, which brings up an interesting question. Uh, how do you set up the relationship between the foster family and and the parents who whose child is now in that foster family, obviously, the, maybe the parents want to maintain some sort of relationship. Is that something that you uh, kind of mediate, or is it something that they work out together? No, um, that's something. That usually, CFS takes the lead on that um, and kind of sets the boundaries on what you know, what kind of communication. Because you don't want to confuse the like. child, right? No, and I always tell parents they need to go with what CFS is saying, regardless of whether they agree with it or not, because. At that, it's their decision. Um, so they really set the circumstance for that. I just, um, I work now, with the parents many, to keep many, an open mind. Many people would say, well, gee, that's not fair because, well, what, what if I got my act together and, and uh, I'm, I'm better now and all is well and good? I mean, I've proven myself. I got a job. I've got a house. I've got, you know, why can't I have my kids back? I mean, th- th- those are questions I realize are difficult, but those are questions I'm sure you get all the time. Um, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean that's more of child and family services yeah. avenue though. Okay. They kind of make sure. make those decisions. Um, and until you know parental rights are terminated, they they're still kind of working with the family on that. All right, uh, we're going to go to a break here in a second. I just want to tease the next discussion topic. Okay, I was watching Annie with my daughter the other day. Okay, uh, and there's a discussion early on in the movie about with the older kids and the younger quote unquote cuter kids, right? And my daughter didn't understand why didn't anybody why won't why doesn't anyone want to adopt the older kid? But that's a real problem. It's not just a movie problem. There yeah. are kids that after they reach a certain age are almost unadoptable in Montana, in in Missoula. Yeah. So I want to talk about that when we get back from the. Stay break. with us. Here we go. By the way, all three lines open seven two one twelve ninety. Hey, thanks for joining us on Talk Back. It is Wednesday, and we are thrilled to have, uh, we have Katie Gurton in studio. She's with New Youth Dynamics, and uh, she is, of course, Youth Dynamics is Child and Family Behavioral Health Services, which is a lot to put on your business card. So uh, we, we have callers. So let's get right back to the phone. Now, now you wanted to uh, bring up a topic. I did want to throw this out there. Yes, it, yes. What I teased before the break, the, the age issue. Talk about that for a second for us. Um. It's really easy to find homes for youth that are under five years old to um, license families that want youth under under five years old. But it's very hard to find families who are willing to bring in older children. Um, and how, how how old do you go? I mean, 16, 15, 17? What? 17. Really? Yeah. Okay. Um, right. So n- normally most of our referrals are for youth between the ages of, I want to say, five and 16 let, let me ask you this this is going to be a tough one maybe okay but okay this is what would fit my family perfectly in my <laughs> ideal world of john adopts a kid and doesn't know what the heck he's doing but he tries anyway <laughs> um if i came to you and said hey uh, we would like to adopt a, 
a, a little girl between the ages of five and seven. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we were we would look for adoption. Uh, we don't want a temporary stay sort of situation because we have mm-hmm. kids and we don't want to put any extra burden on them. That sounds so familiar. <laughs> I, I'm sure you do. I'm sure it is. Is that something that we could work on? Is that something we could get? Um, well, absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, there's youth to match that home for your home. Yeah, I, we could make that work. But for before that, I got that you know, that youth for your home, I'd probably be, be turning down a dozen referrals for youth that right. were 13, Because there's 12 14. and 14 and 16-year-old yeah. kids. Yep. And see, so my, my, my problem, and I'm going to be totally honest with you, the reason why I, I'm hesitant to have an older kid in my home is because I have these younger kids. Mm-hmm. These kids have grown up likely modeled with abuse in the home. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm too much of a dad to let something like that happen to my kid. And the truth of the matter is, is there's a huge array of children with array like a whole level of you know how you know the behaviors a whole array of that um we really do work to um to to match children to homes and we let parents have all the information that we have on that youth before they go into the home and we encourage um visits or phone calls for the each other to get to know each other the kid and the family before the child's placed i was going to ask you what part does the child the adoptive child him or herself have to play uh, what, what if everything seems to match up on this end, but the kid says, "I, I just don't really like them." I, I, you know, I, you <laughs> know what I mean. This is a likely scenario. Is here. is is uh, how how much do you take that into account? Um, I, you know, I've never really heard that off the bat before a placement happened. Okay. Um, usually, the youth, you know, want to go somewhere, especially if they're sitting in shelter her- care or group home care. Right. They're right. just excited to get okay. out. Well, <laughs> let, 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 let's get to the phones. Uh, James has been waiting. James, thanks for holding. You're on. Go ahead. Hey, uh, I had two questions. You basically answered my first one with a uh, line of questions just now. But, you know, my wife and I have five kids. We're a combined family. And um, we had one between us. And uh, shortly after that, lost three pregnancies. Two of them were advanced. And so, you know, we kind of have this void. And we've thought, hey, maybe we can go through foster care. Because adoption agencies don't really consider us because we're a big family. Mm Mm-hmm. So that was kind of my question is how that works. Is it a viable means of going about adoption? I, yeah, you kind of answered those, but, um, you know, the other question I had was uh, how active are you guys in, like, pursuing um, kind of, like, empty nesters for the older kids? Because for the same reason as um, the other host, I forgot his name. <laughs> John, John um, and Peter. John, that's right. Uh, I really wouldn't want an older child in my home i have you know my kids range range from four to 16 mm-hmm. and you know it's 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 just already kind of chaotic <laughs> mm-hmm. so so you know we think younger you know four or five years old but mm-hmm. down the road you know when the last one leaves or or even when she's the only one left you know and we we kind of say hey maybe it's a better time because you've already because you've already established a, a, a history of, of loving kids that come from outside the home, right? Yeah. So I, yeah. So I'm just kind of wondering: Do you actively pursue go, or go after families that are kind of empty nesters or about to be as a means of like adopting out the older kids? You know, I I kind of actively. Thanks for the call, James. Um, I kind of actively pursue. You know, I try to find as many avenues as possible to to reach people who want to be foster parents. Um, I haven't specifically tried to just go after empty nesters. Um, you know, I but that that would be a good thing for me to do. I try to get anybody who would like to do it though, because there's children from four all the way to seventeen who need homes. And this is one of the things I think our government's a huge letdown. I often do. I'll be honest. I mean, this is a talk show where we talk about politics, so. <laughs> government's frequently a letdown for me but our government a a local city state whatever Mm -hmm. it does so much effort to get people to know about the services it provides you know just in my short life uh well i'm not that young anymore i'm 33 now but you know i i've seen when we were poor we had all this targeted advertising telling us about uh, how to get on the snap program how to get housing subsidies when we were uh pregnant and had our first kids we were told you know you need to sign up for this wick you got to get onto this this thing is this is what you need your family needs this but never as a parent that could house a foster child have i ever 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 have been approached to say hey would you consider being a foster parent and that's and, unfortunate and all this time there's what 2200 kids well or at least a thousand kids in montana mm-hmm. 
At least. Suffering through a system that shuffles them from one house to another, sometimes being split up from their families or being shipped to other parts of the state. And our government doesn't seem to give a blank that this is happening and that there's a need out there. Right. And that there's a need that could be filled. Well, I think you just I think you just vocalized that very well. We're going to come right back. And Emmett, we'll get your call on here in just a minute. Only about eight minutes left in the program. If you have a question or a comment for Katie from Youth Dynamics? We'll be right back. And hey, we're back on Talkback 721-1290 is our number. We ch- John and I just do what? So, uh, yeah, just about an earth-shattering <laughs> statement here. So um, we've been talking about all this, ta- this need and stuff. Um, I didn't realize that foster parents basically get paid to be foster parents. Yeah, they do. They tell, get- tell us about this. Is, uh, this is new to me. This is, yeah, it's new to me, too. <laughs> I don't know the exact rate um, through the state, um, but I know you, um, like Youth Dynamics will pay 37 I think it's $37. It ends up being $865 a month for room and board fee- fees that is tax, it's a tax-free stipend every month that the youth place in the home. Plus, foster parents, um, if they adopt, they get a huge tax credit. It's like $10,000. Right. So... Well, yeah, there's a lot of incentive. That's, there. that's very good. Hey, Emmett, good morning. You're on Talkback. Go ahead. Oh, thanks for taking my call. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I've, um, I don't know what this is a fascinating conversation, but I do have a question. You know, I know that there are absolutely needs that, um, and times that children should be removed from families that are abusive, dysfunctional, alcoholic, whatever, drug addicted. But I've heard too many horror stories, you know, of. Children removed from God-fearing homes because, one, maybe they were homeschooled or were teaching their children that homosexuality is a sin, or maybe they, the parents were involved in, let's say, militia of Montana, and they lived in the wilderness and were survivalists. Now, those children shouldn't be removed from hey, home. Hey, Emmett, really quick, just because uh, I know yeah, we, we, we went here a little bit earlier. I just want to give you a heads up. So, what? so Katie is on the other end of things. There is a government system that does the things that you're concerned about. Uh-huh. And and yeah. if you want to address the way that that's handled, you yeah. need to talk with the government and the laws yeah, that go behind this system. That's child and family services. That's, yeah. true, that's child and family Katie services. Seen this? Has Katie ever seen anything like this? I was just wondering, you know. Okay. Well, let's ask her. Uh, what do you think, Katie? What I can tell you is um, I think there's a lot of people are so afraid of child and family services and removal of children. But, you know, it is actually not so easy to get your child removed. Um They do an investigation, and I mean, I've seen, I mean, I've worked in child services a lot, and they, I mean, they do a pretty thorough investigation, and they they really do make every possible effort to keep children and families together and not do removal. Yeah, everyone hears these stories, these horror stories about kids that get taken that probably shouldn't be, Mm -hmm. but the other story that I hear and read more frequently is the byline at the end of the story after you read that some kid was killed that this was the third time that their parents had been brought in under suspect of beating their children. You know, they, they, get, they gave too much grace in many cases. So anyway, just thought I'd throw that out. Okay, here's some, here's some thoughts uh, from the Facebook community. Uh, okay, Katie wants to know, uh, at what age can children in the foster care system become emancipated and what are the criteria? Oh, I don't know that exactly, but I think it's 16 that they can emancipate. Can you explain what that means? I mean, does Lincoln get up on a stool and make a proclamation or? Um, They can become their own. They can get out of the system, make their own decisions, be essentially like their own guardian. So they could say, I'm going to live in my own house. Yeah. They rent my own place. And they actually have programs for that. Um, Hmm transition programs for youth. Okay. All right. So, so uh, real quickly, and I know, I know probably have another caller here just said we have four minutes left in the program. Oh, let's get Kitty. We'll talk to you in just a second. Okay, Kitty, uh, go ahead. You're on with Katie. Kitty, Katie, Katie, Kitty, go ahead. I don't know. Okay. Anyway, um, I have a child from an open adoption. Okay. And we call uh, her mother Tummy Mummy. Okay. We just learned about her recently. Anyway, Mike, and he's a special needs child. Who pays for the special needs, especially if you adopted when you, well, not adopted, when you go through the foster care system? Who pays for those special needs, especially those kids who need a lot of counseling? Um, and then how often are they uh, allowed or not allowed to contact their parents um, or their, their, their birth 
parents. I don't know what you call Yeah, them. exactly right. So right. if they're in the foster care system, C- CPS, makes, CPS makes that decision kind of on what that looks like and how often the, that contact can happen. Um, in Medicaid, there's like the state, they, those kids have full Medicaid, which plays, pays for all um, therapeutic special and it needs. it doesn't matter the parent's background nope. as far as financial. Nope. It doesn't matter your background financial. That Medicaid is tied to them, not you. Okay. And then also, um, who, who does all the counseling for the parents and for the other children? Because sometimes it would be a hard decision for everybody. Um, I know that... Thanks, um, thanks Kitty. I know that Youth Dynamics does, and there's other mental health centers in town, community-based mental health centers in town that will do that, um, do those services for the family. Okay. okay. Uh, right. Some more questions from Facebook. Uh, Elena says, being an adoptive family is a little different from being a foster family. Foster families get a monthly payment, and they have to do whatever the agency tells them to do, even though the family feels the child is or could be more harmed. I have been there and done it. So just wanted to yes. get your case. What kind of control does the agency have over m- me, for example, if I were to be a foster parent? Um, so the agency doesn't really have so much control as the state. This child and family services does. Um, they don't have control over you, but they have control over what you do with that youth. So oftentimes they'll let you take the youth out of state, out of county. They'll usually write a blanket statement for that. You do need to get permission before you leave the country. Um, if, now, now what about going to church, things like that? I mean, it's really um, that up to if, the home? If rights have been terminated, it's pretty much up to the home. Um, the CFS will usually go with what the home wants to do. They want the child to be included in the home's sure. stuff. Right. Um, you know, there's certain things. The child does have to be vaccinated. If they're in foster care. They all have to be vaccinated. Um, they, you know... Non-GMO it, food. Yeah. They gotta, no. No. I'm just no. Uh, <laughs> no Cheetos. If, uh, um, they got to wear socks and sandals. This is Missoula after all. So if the biological parents or the youth doesn't want to go to church and they're a foster, your foster family, you can't. Um, you can't force them. You can't force those yeah, kids yeah. to go to church and you can't use religion as a pun- okay. like participation okay. or non-participation we're, we're as punishment. Almost out of time. Okay. So real quick. So give us some contact information. How can we, how do we get a hold of you? Um, you can get a hold of me at um, 728-967. 72 at Youth Dynamics um, or at youthdynamics.org is our website okay. or um, by email or at 619 Southwest Higgins Suite E, which is our office. And we hope you get flooded with calls. Seriously, we really do. Thank you so you're, much. You're a good person, Katie, and you're doing good work and we appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Best of luck to you. So, John, what's coming up tomorrow? Uh, tomorrow we'll be speaking, uh, maybe for the last time, with Alex Apostle, oh. superintendent of School District 1. That's right. He's got a new gig over in in Washington State and uh, has had a chance to visit with him. So this could be our last opportunity to visit with Alex. You guys have a great day, and we will see you tomorrow on Talkback at 830.